All right, so in this example, we've got uh, two radio towers emitting radio, so in just antennas emitting radio waves, a uh, certain number of crests per second. And we're assuming they're both uh, connected to the same radio station. So what should we assume about the properties of the waves coming out of these? Would they have the same speed? Yeah, they've got to have the same period and of course, same frequency as well. So we know period A equals period B and likewise frequency A equals frequency B. And if the periods and frequencies are the same, what else should we expect to be the same here? The wavelength? Yeah, they're gonna have the same wavelength as well. Because they're both uh, waves in the same, same type of wave in the same medium. <clears throat> so they're gonna have the same speed and therefore same frequency means same wavelength. By the way, what, if, we did, if we needed to do calculations with speed, what speed would we use for these waves? Meters per second. How many meters per second? 340. 40. That's the speed of what kind of wave? Sound. Sound, sound, wave. sound waves. Sound waves are speed approximately 340 meters per second. Radio is not sound though. Radio is actually a form of what? Electromagnetic? Yeah, radio waves are electromagnetic waves, which is just a fancy way of saying light. The spectrum of electromagnetic waves is visible light and a whole bunch of other forms of light, basically just different wavelengths of light beyond the visible spectrum. So you've got visible light, with, which has wavelengths around like from I don't know the exact values, but somewhere around like 300 nanometers to 900 nanometers. And then anything shorter wavelength than that, you can't see, but it still counts as a form of light. Anything with longer wavelength, you also can't see, but it still counts as a form of light. So radio waves is just light with a wavelength beyond the visible spectrum. And within the visible spectrum, if we're talking about light you can see, what does wavelength tell you? What's the difference that you would perceive between different wavelengths of light? Like if you're looking at light with a 400 nanometer wavelength and different light with an 800 nanometer wavelength, what would you see differently? Intensity? Uh, what was that? Intensity? Intensity is more about amplitude in terms of how bright it is. So the brightness would be related to the, uh, the color. Yeah, the wavelength of light is the color. If we're talking about visible light, wavelength tells you the color as opposed to for sound, the wavelength tells you the pitch, what note you're listening to. But since light, in, in terms of light, the wavelength for visible light tells you what color you're looking at. Uh, so each, wavelength, or each color is really a, ra a range of wavelengths. There's a certain range of wavelengths that we would call green, a certain range of wavelengths we would call bluish. Uh, but radio waves are just a different wavelength outside the visible spectrum. So you could essentially think of radio waves as a color that you can't see. Likewise, microwaves are just a different color that you can't see. Gamma rays, X-rays, infrared, ultraviolet are just different wavelengths that you can't see because they're beyond the visible spectrum. And these forms of light, these electromagnetic waves are very useful for communications because they don't require a physical medium. You don't need the presence of air to send radio waves or any other form of light light can travel through empty space. As opposed to sound waves, there's gotta be some physical material for them to pass through. But light waves are great for communication because they can travel through empty space and also they are tremendously fast. The speed of this is gonna be speed of light, usually written as C. Anyone know about how fast that is? Three times 10 to the eight three times 10 to the eight meters per second, or written down in full 300 million meters per second. Ludicrously fast. So that's the value of speed you would use for any form of light, whether it's visible light, radio waves, X-rays, infrared, ultraviolet, 
they're all going at this speed. So if you need to find the wavelength from the frequency, or if you need to find the frequency from the wavelength, you'd use this as the velocity value. Any questions on that so far? And in this case, it doesn't really give us a value for wavelength or frequency, but it does tell us that the distance between the two antennas is, I think that was a fourth of a wavelength. So we've got a quarter wavelength distance between the two antennas. And we wanna know if you're standing at some location, do you, per, do you observe constructive interference or destructive interference or somewhere in between? Uh, one other piece of information we have, I think this told us something about the phase constant here. It tells us uh, there is a phase constant difference such that each maximum from antenna A is emitted a quarter period earlier than those of antenna B. And it specifically describes it as the signal from A is high over two ahead of the signal from B. That is, A emits a crest earlier, and then B emits the same crest a little bit later. These are both emitting essentially the same wave. They're both spitting out crests, but they're not synchronized. A emits a crest a little bit earlier, and then B emits the crest. A emits a crest, then B emits a crest. A emits a crest, B emits a crest. They're offset by a quarter cycle, which we're writing as pi over 2 because we want to express it as a phase difference. And how would you write this as an equation? Um, I have a question real quick. Yeah, um, is it, does that, does the pi over two, like saying A is pi over two ahead of B, does that depend on which way the wave is moving? Um, not really, because the, the phase, if we're expressing this as a phase, phase constant difference, phase constant is talking about what's going on at the source. So uh, okay. you can make a phase constant, you can ignore everything else about the wave, all the other locations and just say, this source at location A and this source at location B are out of sync with each other. Mm, okay, cool, thank yes, you. Different times. Uh, specifically, A emits a crest earlier and B emits a crest a little bit later. Is this a specific problem? Uh, yeah, this is, uh, we're looking at question three on FNT number four here. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So, and this is specifically asking uh, if you're standing in various locations, like if you're standing directly to the north or directly to the east, uh, what sort of interference would you observe in those locations? So first of all, we wanna rewrite this as an equation. If we wanna say A is emitting a crest a fourth of a cycle ahead of B, how do we write that as an equation? In terms of phi sub A and phi sub B. So could it be like phi sub a minus phi sub b is equal to pi over two? Yeah, the difference should be pi over two. And since it's saying a is pi over two ahead of b, we would expect phi a to be the larger value. Alternatively, we could write that as phi sub a, we just add phi b to both sides. Since A is ahead of B, we should expect A's phase constant to be a little bit larger than B's phase constant. So that will be B's phase constant plus an extra pi over two, an extra quarter cycle. And sometimes it's kind of difficult to tell ahead of time whether it's gonna be plus or minus pi over two. Uh, what, in, in other words, which one of these is gonna be the larger value? But we can look into that later and figure out uh, whether the results make sense. If we get some results that don't really seem to make sense, that's probably because we chose the wrong sign for this. But for now, let's say phi A is pi over two, a quarter cycle more than phi B. Any questions on these parameters we have so far? Or how we know those? All right, then let's look into these different locations. We wanna figure out, for example, if you are standing at a location 
Uh, let's say you are currently standing directly to the north. So you're standing somewhere to the north of the center. And of course you can't hear radio waves because they're not sound. You can't see radio waves, even though they're light, you can't see them because they're outside the visible spectrum. So you need a tool to observe these. And what tool would work here? How do you pick up the signal from radio waves? An antenna? Yeah, you need an antenna. You've got your receiver, just a little box full of mysterious electronics with an antenna. The radio waves cause electrical vibrations inside the antenna, which causes electrical currents to flow within the radio box. And that is used to make the speaker vibrate so you can turn it into sound. So we often think of radio waves as sound because we use them to create sound. But it's not really that sound is coming out of these antennas. Radio waves, a form of light, is coming out of the antennas. The receiver is a tool that picks up the radio wave and uses it to create a sound wave that carries the same information. If we want to figure out what sort of interference we've got going on here, what would be a good way to write that out, keep track of all that information? A phase chart? Yeah, let's try writing out a phase chart. So we want to keep track of all the pieces of total phase. We want the 2 pi times frequency times time. And you can write this as 2 pi times time divided by period, or as 2 pi times time times frequency. Because dividing by period and multiplying by frequency are the same thing. In phase charts, I often find it more useful to write it in this format, but either way works. And then we have uh, 2 pi times distance divided by wavelength. And should we treat that as plus or minus here? Maybe minus. Yeah. And why would we treat that as minus in this case? Um, since it's like a, I think it would be a 3D wave, right? So that would be an outgoing wave? Yeah. This is a way of spreading out from the antenna in three dimensions. Waves in two and three dimensions and beyond are always spreading outwards from the source. You're never really going to see radio waves like collapsing inwards on a single point. At least not if there's only one source. It's possible to set up a whole bunch of sources so you send waves inwards towards a single point. But if you just have one source or just a few sources, it's always spreading outwards from the source. And then we've also got the phase shift and total phase. And often what we do is set up a row for wave A and a row for wave B and then another row for delta. But in this case, since we've got several locations to keep track of, let's skip the wave A and wave B rows and just look at delta for each location. So let's say delta to the north. And we can see what's going on to the north of here. Uh, also, we want to be consistent about this. Do you want to subtract uh, A minus B or B minus A for all of these? A minus B. Try A minus B, sure. So I'm just going to make a note of that here. And we could go either way. We just want to make sure we're consistent about it. So I'm just making a note that all of these deltas are going to represent a value of A minus a value of B. <clears throat> uh, is there any difference in frequency between the two antennas? No. Same frequency, right? Is there any difference in what time they arrive? No. No. They're arriving, yeah, they're arriving at the same time. There is a difference in what time the crests are emitted, but we're going to take care of that with a phase shift difference instead. So since the two waves are the same frequency and arriving at the same time, this has a value for each wave, but it's the same value. So the difference would be zero. And in fact, that's going to be true throughout this entire column in this case. In general, if the waves are the same frequency, this term is going to be no difference. The, in fact, the only time this term would really matter is if the frequencies are different. If the frequencies are different, then we have delta 
2 pi f t. If the frequencies are different, we have to keep the frequency inside the delta. 2 pi is a constant though, so that can be pulled out. And the waves are arriving at your observer's location at the same time, so we can pull that out. So we get 2 pi t times delta frequency. And one of the important things about that is if the frequencies are different, that means the type of interference you get as a result depends on what time it is. You actually get different types of interference as time passes. And what do we call that phenomenon? If you're changing what type of interference you get as time passes, what's going on there? Beats. Yeah, that's the cause of beats. Beats is the wobbling, uh, wobbling loudness. You're wobbling between loud, quiet, loud, quiet, loud, quiet as time passes because there's a difference in frequency. So if the frequencies are different, this term becomes the most important term in the whole equation. If the frequencies are the same, this whole term is zero, so we don't care. Any questions on that so far? Um, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Sorry, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, so I was gonna ask, so how do we know that, um, that the types of interference are changing as time goes? In this case? I mean, not in the, the case we're looking at in problem three, but in terms of if the frequencies are different, the, so this term, the two pi FT, if the frequencies are different, you can't pull the frequency out of the delta. You can pull the two pi out of the delta, you can pull the time out of the delta because they're both arriving at the same time. So you end up with a term in the total phase difference that's two pi T times delta F. And the total phase difference is what determines what kind of interference you've got, whether it's constructive or destructive or somewhere in between those. So if the delta phase is zero, if the, or sorry, delta frequency, if the two waves are the same frequency, this whole term becomes zero, which means time doesn't matter, only distance traveled and phase shift matter. But if the delta frequency is not zero, if the two waves have different frequencies, that means the delta phase formula has a term with time in it. It becomes time dependent. So that means the, frequent, the type of interference depends on what time it is. If delta frequency exists, then type of interference depends on what time it is. If there is no delta frequency, if the frequencies are the same, this term becomes zero, so time doesn't matter. Any questions on that so far? Um, um, oh, go, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I just had one quick question. So is it like, if they just don't indicate that there's like two different frequencies, we can just always assume it's a zero or the same, sorry, not zero. Yeah, that they, there's no difference in frequency. Because if okay. the, the frequencies are different, then that's usually the most important part of the situation. It's gonna lead to beats and beats is probably what we actually care about. In fact, you can see that in problem one on the FNT with the, uh, the two bagpipes that are slightly out of tune. That's different frequencies, which means it's gonna to lead to hearing beats. Okay, case, thank you. I think in this case, what really tells us that it's the same frequency, even though it doesn't specify it in those words, it says these are two antennas, that it's a radio station transmitting from two antennas. If this is just one radio station using two antennas to transmit, those two antennas are presumably both getting a signal from the same radio station. So we've got one electronic device in the radio station building that's sending electrical signals to both of the antennas. It's sending the same electrical signal to tell them create the same type of wave. There's just a signal delay in one of them so that we have a phase difference, but everything else about the waves is exactly the same. Any other questions on that so far? Uh, yeah, so basically, um, so in regular cases, like from before, we were just doing 2 pi um, n, 2 pi n for the, or for like constructive, right? So uh, now, where did the the f and the t oh, come from? I was just, so this isn't part of the total phase. This is, I was just writing it here because I needed some space. Oh, okay. The total so, phase is, is all of these added together. So the total okay. phase will include this term from the F times T and this term and this term. But the only one of those terms that is even possible to depend on time is this term. These will be constants as time passes. 
Okay, until unless we have a case where the frequency changes, then we also put the T and the F in inside the delta, or only the F. Sorry. Yeah, if the frequency is the well, if the frequency is the same, this is just going to be zero. So that means the phase difference, total phase difference, depends only on these terms. Yeah, if it changes, then mm -hmm. we put the frequency inside the delta, right? Uh, well, the frequency is. I mean, if you extract, if you look at a delta of all this you get the two pi can be pulled out, time can be pulled out because both waves are arriving at the observer at the same time. So you just get two pi t times delta frequency. So if there's a difference in frequency, this term is non-zero and it's gonna be the most important term in the whole equation because it depends on time. If the frequencies are the same, delta f is zero, so this whole term is zero and we don't care about it. Okay, thank you. Can you see, I had a quick question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> this only really matters if we're talking about beats. I mean, this is what causes beats if the frequencies are different. In this case, the frequencies are the same, so this term drops out. Uh, did you have another question? Yeah, uh, sorry. Um, so I, so you said that the type of interference depends on like what time it is, if there is a change in frequency, what does that exactly mean? Because couldn't there be like a change in like uh, like the uh, position as well? So that could also like be dependent on if it's like constructive or destructive? Yeah, worst case scenario, it might be the case that we have all three of these terms. Maybe uh -huh. the difference in frequency, the two sources are emitting different, different notes or different colors or whatever. Mm -hmm. and maybe there's also a difference in path length. They're traveling different distances to get to the location and maybe the sources are also out of phase with each other. Mm -hmm. The total phase difference would be all three of these deltas added together. But these two will be constants as time passes. These two terms are just a number. They don't have uh... time. <clears throat> but this one does have time. So that means the total phase difference in that case would be two pi delta F times T plus a constant. Okay. Your constants in terms of time. Okay, so I've, over time, the it's the two pi x over lambda, and then the phi constant is going to be the same, right? Or the phase it's constant. These do not okay. change as time passes, but this one does because it has a times t in it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And because of that time dependency, that means the delta the delta total phase, and therefore the type of interference change as time passes. And that's exactly what leads to beats, changing from constructive to destructive to constructive to destructive as time passes, it cycles between loud and quiet and loud and quiet. Any other questions on that so far? And of course, in this case, we don't need to worry about that because they're the same frequency. So we can ignore time entirely. Time does not matter in this problem. We certainly have the other ones to, to consider though. Like for instance, the uh, phase difference. Again, we're subtracting A minus B for consistency. So phi A minus phi B. What's phi A minus phi B gonna equal? Pi over two. Yeah, it should be pi over two. You could find that for instance by substituting this whole thing in for phi A. The phi B's cancel out left with pi over two. And that's going to be true throughout this entire chart. Because if you walk around, if you move from here to here, you're changing maybe your position. You're changing how long the waves or how far the waves travel to get to your location. But phi depends only on the sources. You're not changing the way the sources are wired up just by walking around. So this is going to be the same pi over two no matter where the observer is. But these ones we're going to have to consider very carefully. If you're standing somewhere to the north and we take a look at the distances traveled, we've got wave A traveling from antenna A to your location. So this would be distance XA. And we've got wave B traveling from antenna B to your location. So this distance would be XB. What do you notice about those distances? They're the same. Yeah, they very much look the same. We've got complete geometric symmetry here. This is mirror image of each other. 
if you're standing on that line of symmetry, the two waves travel the same distance. XA equals XB, so delta X is going to be zero. And if we take the difference here, this out in a little more detail, we've got negative two pi X over lambda. If we apply a delta to that whole thing, in this case, the lambdas are the same, so we can pull out the two pi and the lambda. And we're left with just delta X. So generally this term is gonna be negative two pi over lambda times the difference in path length. In this case, directly to the north, difference in path length is zero. So this whole thing becomes zero. And now we know every term in the row. So we can just add these up. Zero time difference plus zero position difference plus pi over two phase difference equals pi over two. So that's our total phase difference. What does that tell you about the type of interference here? Is it partial? partial? Yeah. And how can we tell that that is partial interference? Since it's not like the integer, but like the fraction. Yeah, it's not an integer multiple, specifically not an integer multiple of pi. If it was a whole number, it was a, uh, specifically an even multiple of pi, that would be a whole number of cycles. If it was an odd multiple of pi, that would be something in a half cycles. But anything other than those is just somewhere in between those. It's not a whole number of cycles. It's not something in a half cycles. It's just somewhere in between. So we would definitely call this partial interference. And what does that tell you about the signal you're going to receive? If this were a sound wave, what would you expect to hear? Something just a little bit louder than what you were going to? Or yeah, a little quieter? A little loud, not too loud, not too quiet. For sound, constructive interference would be very loud. Destructive would be very quiet. And partial would just be somewhere in between in terms of loudness. The thing is, though, these aren't sound waves, right? They're radio waves, a form of light or electromagnetic radiation. The loudness of what you hear from your radio receiver is really more about how far you turn up or down the volume. So you get to control how loud the speaker is using the settings of your radio receiver. So the interference here isn't really about loudness. It's really more about how strong the signal is. Constructive interference is going to mean a very strong signal in terms of you're able to receive it very clearly. You get a very crisp uh, signal. You get exactly the information the radio station is sending out. Destructive interference would mean the information largely cancels itself out. That you have, that it's difficult to pick up that information. It's going to be very crackly. And then partial is just going to be somewhere in between. So it's really more about how strong the signal is rather than how loud it is. And pragmatically, a weaker signal just means you're going to need a bigger antenna in order to pick it up. So partial interference here. Uh, what about if you move to south of these? If you're standing south of these with your radio receiver, what do you notice? It would be the same as north since the x distance would be the same from both A and B. Exactly. We might have a different distance, but they're still the same distance as each other. We still have that perfect symmetry. This distance traveled by wave A and this distance traveled by wave B are the same as each other. So that means we're still going to have no time difference, no path length difference, pi over two phase difference, which means this result works for north or south. Those are going to behave exactly the same. So really, we just need to look at east and west to figure out if those are any different. Any other questions on that so far? All right, let's investigate, let's say, to the east. If you are standing over here east of the antennas with your radio receiver, then what's going to be different here? Yeah. 
B would be closer than A? Yeah, B is closer than A. So B is going to travel a shorter distance. Wave B only has to travel this far. So that would be XB. And A is going to have to travel further. It is traveling all this distance. So there's definitely going to be a difference in path length here. And we want to figure out what is that difference in path length. Again, we want to be consistent and subtract A minus B. So can you write XA in terms of XB or can you write XB in terms of XA? Like it looks like XA is clearly a longer path, but how much longer? Would it be two trains long? Wait, what was that? Yeah, would it be like two times longer? Uh, not necessarily. I mean, on this diagram, it kind of looks like two times longer, but you can't necessarily trust that a diagram is to scale, especially since it doesn't tell us okay. in the how far to the east. Maybe you're standing like three feet to the east of this tower, or maybe you're standing 10 miles to the east of this tower. So we don't know how far XB is. But however far XB is, XA is how much longer? What's that extra distance traveled? One fourth of the wavelength. Yeah, that extra one fourth wavelength between the towers is exactly how much further it's traveling. XA is XB plus an extra fourth of a wavelength. So we've got the XB distance plus this much extra. XB plus an extra quarter wavelength. So um, how do you know specifically one, um, one fourth? Uh, that was given in the problem. If you take a look at problem three in the diagram, it's, it says that the distance from antenna A to the center and from antenna B to the center is an eighth of a wavelength. Lambda over eight plus lambda over eight gives us a fourth of a wavelength total. So that's just the distance between the antennas. Actually, yeah, it does say that in the very first sentence of the problem. The transmitting from two antennas set lambda, four, lambda over four apart. So the distance between this, the antennas is given as a fourth of a wavelength. We don't know how long a wavelength is, but we know this distance is exactly one quarter wavelength. So if we subtract those, again, in this exact order, A minus B, what do we get? One fourth of a wavelength. Right. Lambda over four is the delta x here. That's the extra distance traveled by wave A. So if we plug that in here, let's say we're looking for delta when we're on the east side. We still have no difference in time or frequency, but this is going to be a negative two pi over lambda times the delta x, which we just found is lambda over four. Multiply those together, and what happens? Negative pi over two. The lambdas cancel out. Two over four reduces to one half. So we get negative pi over two. So that's our difference in the position term. Add those together. We've got zero plus negative pi over two plus pi over two equals zero. Zero total phase difference. They end up canceling out, which suggests we should get what type of interference here? Constructive. What was that? Constructive interference. Yeah. If there's no difference, then the two waves are, are like crest and crest traveling together, no difference at all. So that means this is constructive interference. In other words, you would get a very strong signal over here. It's going to be very easy for your radio receiver to pick up that signal and interpret it into a radio show or music or whatever. Uh, and if we look at this conceptually, because again, I, I'm always a little dubious of, did I actually choose the right sign on that? I can never really be certain if I was correct about the positive or negative sign. But if we take a look at what's actually going on in terms of the waves traveling, we know A and B are both emitting crests and troughs and crests and troughs. Let's just focus on one crest. 
If we're looking at just one crest traveling, which one of these antennas emits that crest first? B. Which one is ahead? Would it be B? Didn't it tell us in the problem one of them was ahead? Uh, or would it be A? Yeah, it says each maximum okay. of antenna A is emitted a fourth of a period earlier than those from antenna B. In other words, A is pi over two ahead of B. So A emits a crest spreading out in all directions. And then a little bit later, a fourth of a period later, B emits what we might call the same crest. So A then B, A then B. A emits the crest first, and then a little bit later, B emits the same crest. And that's traveling out in all directions, but we only care about the direction towards what? To the east. Towards, what was that? Towards east. Yeah, we only care about the wave front traveling east because that's where we're observing from. So we just care about the wave fronts that actually reach the observer. So wave A emits a crest and it's traveling to the east. How much of a head start does it have in time? How much later is B going to emit the same crest? A is emitting the crest, how much earlier? Uh, one fourth of the period earlier. Yeah. A has a one fourth period head start in time, but it also has to travel longer. So in the course of that one fourth of a period, how far would you expect a wave to travel in one fourth of a period? Would it be a fourth of a cycle? Yeah, a fourth of a, uh, what a quarter period is a quarter cycle in time. In the, that amount of time, it's gonna travel a quarter cycle worth of distance. Because you could think of the period as the amount of time it takes for the wave to travel one wavelength worth of distance. A quarter period is gonna be enough time to travel a quarter wavelength, which happens to be the separation between the two antennas. So over the course of the first quarter period, the wavefront from A travels from A to B. And at that instant, what's antenna B doing? Um, would it be emitting a crest? Yeah, because we've used up our quarter period head start. A mm -hmm. emits a crest early, that crest starts traveling. At the instant, a quarter period later, B emits its own crest, which is now at the same location. And those two crests are now traveling together. If you've got crests traveling together, what type of interference does that suggest? Constructive. Constructive. Crest and crest overlap. And that's exactly what our algebra predicted here anyway. So it looks like we got the signs right. The conceptual side of things, moving the crests around and imagining what's going to happen as this crest travels and this crest joins in, the conceptual imagination side of things suggests constructive interference. And the algebra also suggests constructive interference. So I'm pretty confident that this is constructive interference on the east side. You're going to receive a very strong, clear signal. <coughs> Any questions on that so far? So let's see what happens to the west. standing over here to the west. You're still getting no time difference or frequency difference. You're still getting uh, pi over two phase difference. But for this one, we're going to have to be careful about the delta x. Because in this case, getting rid of these distances from earlier. Now, which wave is gonna be traveling further to get to your new location? Wave B. Yeah, wave B is gonna to have to travel further. Whereas wave A is a much shorter distance. 
So in this case, we'd say wave B or XB, the path length traveled by wave B is XA plus this much extra. And now when we subtract, and again, we want to subtract in the same order, XA, the shorter one, minus XB, the longer one, what would we get? Negative lambda over four. Yeah, changing the order, we're subtracting these, in, or changing the size of this reverses the size. We get negative lambda over four, since A is traveling the shorter distance. So if we're multiplying in a negative lambda over four, what do we get when we multiply these together? Positive pi over two. Positive pi over two. So changing to the other side reverses the sign on them. And now when we add these, zero plus pi over two plus pi over two, what do we get? Pi. Yeah, that's going to be pi. One pi is half a cycle. So what type of interference is that? Destructive. Yeah, that is destructive interference which essentially means you get no signal at all. You're gonna get a, maybe a very weak signal or maybe no signal at all. So standing over here, you try to tune into the radio station and you just get static crackles, no signal whatsoever. Any questions on that so far? Um, why was the lambda over four negative again? Uh, it has to do with the order we're subtracting. For consistency, we always wanna subtract in the same order. So we're subtracting XA minus XB, just like we have there. But in this case, XA is the smaller one because it's traveling a shorter distance. And XB is the longer, it's traveling this extra wavelength over four with the distance. So if you subtract a short value minus a large value, you get a negative as the difference. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And in this case, I mean, in the previous case to the east, A had a head start in time and emitted a cycle earlier. But B had a head start in distance. It didn't have to travel as far. Those head starts in distance and head starts in time cancel each other out. So we get zero distance. But in this case, to the west, A emits a crest earlier, so it has a head start in time. And it doesn't have to travel as far, so it's got a head start in position as well. If the same antenna has a head start in position and time, then we get a large difference. They combine their differences. That combines a quarter cycle head starting position and a quarter cycle head starting time combined to half a cycle offset, and that makes for destructive interference. If you want to try visualizing the motion of the crest, again, which one of these emits the crest earlier? A? Yeah, A emits a crest. A little later, B is going to emit the same crest, but in the meantime, a gets a head start moving to the west. So wave A starts moving to the west. It gets a quarter cycle head start in distance. And then wave B starts. Now these two crests are far apart. As they move, they're going to maintain that same constant distance apart from each other. That distance turns out to be half a wavelength. Half a cycle apart means destructive interference. So on this side, you're going to get no signal at all. Any questions on that so far? So, you know, so if it, they didn't say that it was like emitted any earlier or later, like the, the distance, like the pi four or like the um, lambda over four, like distance between them doesn't have any like influence on like when it was emitted, right? It's just like how far they are. Apart. Yeah, those are the, the distance between the antennas and when it's emitting crests and troughs, those are two separate quantities. So okay, those can so both be independently. Okay, so we only know that it's like emitted earlier because the problem told us that, right? Right, it had to specify that. Okay. Thank the, you. the distance between them is a matter of geography. You built an antenna here, you build an antenna here, this is the distance between them. Uh, the, fa the phase difference though, which one emits a crest earlier or later and by how much, that's really a matter of how they are wired in the first place. You can wire them in such a way that one of them's emitting a signal a little earlier or later. You can implement a signal delay but those can both be controlled independently. You can have whatever distance you want based on where you build them and whatever phase difference you want based on how you set up the wiring. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And this can often be useful if you want there to be a dead zone. Like maybe there's some something going on over here that you don't want to mess around with. Maybe there's, maybe there's an airport over here 
and they need to be able to use radio waves to communicate between control tower and airplane. You don't want to have a situation where the airplane's radioing the control tower saying, can we land? And all they get in response is a bunch of music. So in a situation like this, by deliberately setting up this pair of antennas, you create a region where people will get a very strong radio signal and a region where there will be no signal at all. So you might want to put this in a location between, let's say, a city that wants to get the radio station received and an airport that doesn't want to, want to have extra radio waves messing around with their communications. So it's a very convenient way of getting a directed signal where one direction gets a strong signal, one direction gets no signal at all without having to have any moving parts. You just have the antennas stay where they are, but by changing the phases around, you can choose which direction gets a strong signal and which direction doesn't. Any other questions on that? All right, then that's it for today. I will see you next time. Thank you. Are you uploading this today? Uh, if I have time, yeah, I'll see what I can do. Okay. If not, then tomorrow. Cool. I had a quick question about uh, partial yeah. and um, constructive in that. Um, mm -hmm. For partial, would 13.5 be considered um, like partial or would that be considered destructive? Is that 13.5 what? Oh, 13.5 pi, I think it was. If it's 13.5 pi, then that's uh, somewhere between a whole cycle and a half cycle, so that would be partial. But okay. if it's 13.5 cycles, like 13.5 wavelengths or 13.5 periods, that's something and a half There's cycles, so that would be destructive. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Mm -hmm.